Training Professional Development here at the Texas Advanced Computing Center. And I'm also uh, the Design Safe uh, Training Lead. So we are very pleased to bring you another one of our data set award winners uh, from 2021 on, uh, on, her, on their data sets they've collected from uh, Hurricane Michael. So there we go. Uh, but one thing about our Design Safe uh, webinars, we really appreciate your all's feedback. It, lets us get an idea of what kind of webinars you're looking for in the future, uh, how useful the webinars that we are presenting to you are, uh, what you think of our format, all that fun stuff. So we would love it if you can take your phone out real quick, scan that QR code, and uh, leave us a survey at the end of today's uh, webinar. So today's webinar is about learning from Hurricane Michael. So if you remember back in October of 2018, Hurricane Michael made landfall just, uh, just south of Florida and the damage from the winds and the storm surge uh, were all investigated on a virtual sense and, a, and field data collections as well. So today's uh, webinar is all about how that data was collected, how where the data is stored from and what research and what the data is and how you can embed that data into your own research. Uh, we have today with us uh, Tracy, who is the director of STEER, uh, and she's also an associate professor of civil engineering and global affairs at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, STEER, if you're not familiar, that's the Structural Extreme Event Reconnaissance Network uh, that works with DesignSafe in, in our reconnaissance data collection. Also today, we have David Roosh, who is an associate director of STEER and uh, data standards and assistant professor at Auburn University. And finally, we have Jeffrey Berman uh, with uh, the Neary Rapid Facilities Operations Director and professor at University of Washington. And so it's uh, thank you so much, you all, for joining us this afternoon. Uh, really appreciate your time and we're looking forward to uh, hearing about uh, the lessons that you've all learned from uh, Hurricane Michael and how you integrate that in with Design Safe. Thank you so much and I will hand this off. All right, I think I should have the ability now to share screen. So I'm gonna get us started. So thank you again for that introduction and for the opportunity to be with you all here. Um, so we really appreciate the uh, platform Design Safe is giving us today to deliver this webinar that looks at um, the effects of Hurricane Michael and some of the joint efforts that took place um, between the uh, Rapid Facility as well as STEER and some of the follow-on uh, investigations that occurred um, after our efforts uh, to learn from this particular hurricane. So the learning objectives for today's webinar, we're going to showcase quite prominently a number of data sets that were associated with this event as an example of these multi-institutional longitudinal investigations that yield, I think, really valuable open data sets that are available to you as a member of the NERI community. Our presentation will highlight the way that these data sets were generated, as well as some of the initial learnings from those investigations. But more importantly, we're gonna highlight how that data can now be leveraged um, in ongoing research and investigations, uh, again, that continue the learning from these events. So with that as a backdrop, I first just wanna take you through the idea or importance of how we learn from natural hazard events like Hurricane Michael. This starts for us a very critical opportunity to generate knowledge on the performance of the built environment in an affected community. The field observations that initiate after a community has experienced these events starts a very critical data um, life cycle, a data to knowledge life cycle. And it highlights in particular the role that field observations takes right here at the second step in the process in gathering this vital perishable data. And you're gonna see how the rapid and steer work together in this regard. Now for events like Hurricane Michael, this process is really important because it creates an opportunity then for follow on research that helps us to validate and potentially revise our regulatory system, such as our codes and standards. So that, that follow on work, that research and development here at stage three is critical if we wanna be able to make a lasting impact through those policy mechanisms. And ultimately, yes. Sorry, sorry we're not seeing slides yet. Oh, you don't, you don't <laughs> see slides yet. Okay, no, no. that is interesting and strange. Thank you for catching that. Let me try this again. Do you see this now? There we go. 
Oh, yes. perfect. Thank you for catching that now. My goodness, I had no clue you couldn't see what I could see. All right. And, and so as I was saying, those field observations and feed into research and development that link us into the opportunity to shape um, our regulatory processes and bring that cycle full circle back to affected communities. So the, the message here today is that perishable data, it is the lifeline that drives this cycle. And we want to show you today how that has been leveraged in this event. So just to begin with a little context on our operational model that we're going to talk about here. Um, when STEER responds to an event like Michael, we have a, a protocol that um, rolls out. That protocol first you know, recognizes that we might respond to an event at one of three levels. In the case of Hurricane Michael, as you're going to see today, it started as a tier two response that quickly escalated into a tier three based on the severity of the event. What that means is that we had activated a virtual assessment structural team to start that virtual reconnaissance and begin compiling our preliminary virtual reconnaissance report. That ultimately then drove the activation of what's called a field assessment structural team or FAST to generate the valuable data as well as those early access reconnaissance reports summarizing finding. And our timeline for these kinds of responses then normally would execute with the release of those reports within a few weeks of the initial event as those different arms of our operation are running um, and, and working together. The last step then is an extensive quality control process and data enrichment workflow that then will take that data and make it suitable for this kind of ongoing research that we're gonna talk about today. But what we wanna also emphasize is the importance of recognizing that that data when it's generated by our field teams provides an immediate gateway to start doing additional research. And this particular webinar is gonna showcase how we were able to then use that data to guide some additional follow-on research with additional funding and actually use even that data to validate and advance a number of NERI products. So a quick summary of the event for those who might've forgotten, um, Hurricane Michael made landfall on the 10th of October in 2018, just south of Panama City, Florida. And if you look at our early reports, we had it as a cat four, but know that in the post-storm analysis by the National Hurricane Center, it actually was upgraded to a cat five. And that was due to the recognition that the maximum sustained winds were actually not 155 miles per hour at a, as initially estimated, but were upgraded to 160. Um, notably, the minimum central pressure of this storm at 919 millibars um, is one of the lowest recorded. So this was a historic hurricane by many regards. What's notable about this event was the intensification. The storm rapidly intensified, um, which was a challenge both for emergency management and fascinating meteorologically. It went from a 35 mile per hour tropical depression to a 145 mile per hour Cat 4 hurricane in about 72 hours. And that rapid intensification included a continual intensification to the point of landfall, shown in this radar image here, which is usually not observed. That fast escalation really caused issues because a lot of people sheltered in place for the event, never assuming it would eventually reach what we saw a Cat 5. There were 16 direct deaths and um, dozens more indirect losses of life and about an estimated 25 billion per National Hurricane Center in the losses financially from this event. The timeline for our response that you'll be learning about today, it rolled out in five phases. Um, that included activating our virtual assessment team right after the event uh, took place and running them for about nine days to issue their report. Our first field teams were out the door by October 12th. And then the second phase of that field observation, which we're calling phase three here, um, then ran from November 1st to 8 to continue to collect FAST data, as well as some work supported by the Florida Building Commission. Additionally, um, my co-presenters today secured a rapid grant to do some follow-on work in that same timeline here in phase four, shown in purple. And our friends at the rapid facility continued some data collection on the back end there, which is also presented in this talk today. And what was happening behind all of that is that raw data was now accessible to the community and was getting refined and prep, uh, prepared for the ultimate curation and design safe. So you see a lot of parallel operations taking place in emission of this type. So I'm gonna present for you now the first phase. The virtual teams are active. Imagine this now, it's within hours of the hurricane making landfall and we're starting to collect that perishable data that's available in the public media, if you will, that um, publicly available information to frame our understanding of this event. So our virtual assessment team started that process to prepare their first report on the event. And what I first wanna do is just help you understand the region we're gonna talk about today. 
Um, first of all, one of the more dominant or predominant large um, metro areas that we're going to refer to is Panama City. Uh, there you'll see, you know, um, damaged buildings on the order of about 45,000 units. Um, and then south of that, you'll talk about and hear about Mexico Beach, a smaller community, again, with a high level of destroyed and damaged buildings. The hurricane's landfall um, point is at Tyndall Air Force Base, so right about here on the map, and that site got extensive damage, as you might expect. So these are the communities and some of the sites you're going to hear about today, and that's their orientation here in the panhandle of Florida. Now, one of the first things our virtual teams do is they try to anchor us in the regulatory context of the setting. So I wanna introduce a couple important backdrops to help you interpret the performance we're gonna talk about today. The first is the awareness of something called the Florida Coastal Construction Control Line. Um, and this particular um, line, it is defining the boundary at which structures seaward of that line are required to have their lowest horizontal structural member elevated above the predicted 100 year storm elevation, which would include being able to surpass or provide the feedboard net, uh, freeboard necessary to allow the breaking wave crest to not impact the structure. So that's gonna be notable in this event is the location of that line and the 100 year um, floodplain. In Bay County, just so you know, that floodplain would require elevation on the order of 17 feet to meet that requirement. In 2000, there was a panhandle exemption. This basically said that any building that's more than a mile inland is not subject to wind, windborne debris requirements that other parts of the state would have. So this exempted the panhandle because it was rarely impacted and that's a notable exemption. That was rolled back in 2006 by law. In between that time period, the Florida Building Code rolled out. It was statewide starting in the early 2000s, but a couple things to also be aware of is that when it was released in 2010, it was based on the 2009 International Building Code. It did not incorporate ASC 710. That didn't come on until about 2012. So these give you a few important benchmarks in a regulatory sense of what is going to be key eras in code construction in this region that's gonna govern some of the performance that you see. And this map here from the um, ATC hazards by location interface just gives you an indication of what the design wind speeds would be for a uh, risk category three structure in Panama City. So you get an idea of the wind speeds we're expected to handle here. In terms of what we actually saw in the event, well, now we're seeing, um, you know, the realities. One of the most extremely important products we get in these events is the generation of Applied Research Associates ARA wind fields issued out by NIST and curated in Design Safe. And you can see here from the map that was generated in the immediate days following the event that we have an estimate, the golden contours that you can see wrapping around the track indicate the wind speeds that were simulated by ARA. The gray dashed contours running almost perpendicular are the contours for ASC 7 wind field. And then you are gonna see the track for the storm shown here in blue. What this indicates by this rust colored region that extrudes in along the track indicates areas where the observed wind speeds or at least those predicted by this model are in excess of the design wind speeds. Uh, for this case, a, a risk category two structure. So you're gonna know how far that extends in. It shows you that Michael's wind gusts did not significantly deteriorate as the storm moved inland. And therefore there is a significant swath even inland of structures whose wind speeds um, at the design level were exceeded by up to 28 miles per hour in this event. So that's a notable fact that this was a design level wind event. It's also a design level storm surge event. One could argue that that bar was easy for Michael to surpass, but what you'll see here is the USGS sensor on the Mexico Beach Pier and measured the gray line that you're seeing here, which was the observed water level. The blue line is the storm tide, and they also had a pressure sensor that measured the pressure here in the red line. What it's showing you is the key takeaway point is that we had a storm tide of over 15 feet and a peak water level over 20 feet. So it, indeed, Michael was a historic event. The deep inundation from the storm destroyed many homes because of an insufficient freeboard. That's gonna be a big issue here. And the follow-on investigations done in phase three of our effort really helped to document that. You'll see that in this paper. But basically one of the key learnings was that that 100 year floodplain, it certainly didn't capture the um, extent of inundation we would, we would observe later in the field. Even the zones as X zones, where you're not supposed to be in that floodplain anymore, we saw severe inundation with many blocks of homes literally wiped to their foundation and many owners not having flood insurance. So it certainly was tragic. 
And that catastrophic loss was both a function of the age of the buildings, as well as, again, the low elevation or even on-grade construction in many of these areas that were assumed not to be inundated, um, again, through the adoption of this 100-year floodplain. And I think there's important debate about that issue in this paper, given that that MRI is a much shorter interval than what we would use for something like wind, which is on the order of 700 years. A quick summary now of the damage observed by category of building. What you're gonna see here is that in the area of medical facilities, Hurricane Michael actually devastated four hospitals and 11 nursing homes in the affected area. The two biggest being those in Panama City. Um, the one shown here is the Bay Medical Sacred Heart Building, which uh, was a hospital that had severe roof, envelope and structural damage. School vulnerabilities were also noted. A lot of those tied to long span roofs over gymnasiums. Here's a Jinx Middle School in Panama City, the gym roof literally peels off and it leads to a propagation of failure in the windward and leeward walls. Commercial construction was equally devastated often through rupture of the building envelope, loss of the curtain wall. This notable example here we see from the first federal bank in Panama City, where you have a complete loss of the cladding system and significant interior damage. And some of the most staggering findings of, of our work and that you'll see in this data set is just the destruction of residential construction. We saw the whole spectrum from a loss of roof cover and wall cover to the more substantial damage to the primary structure down to the complete destruction as you see in this powerful image down to bare slabs. Some of the most staggering damage that we saw in this work was the fact that many pre 1970s buildings um, were completely wiped from their foundation and more notably modern construction that didn't have sufficient freeboard even though it had the latest code provision with respect to um, integrating its load path and, and having suitable foundation elements was literally destroyed by the breaking waves riding on the storm surge. The bright spots like the sand castle that you had a lot of media coverage about um, were truly um, isolated in many of the images from this area. With respect to other infrastructure, massive impacts to the power infrastructure in this event, um, 1.6 million out of power across the southeastern United States and all aspects of the power delivery system were impacted from poles to lines, towers and even substations. The uh, Tyndall Air Force Base is again a notable example, it was literally at the landfall point. There was, according to the base commander, extensive damage um, to the roof of every structure at the base and many structural damages to other parts of those buildings. Of particular note, you can see here the hangar where the roof is completely gone, exposing those high value aircraft. And finally, with respect to roads and other transportation networks, a lot of water and debris um, was the story here in the early days. Most of it driven actually by the significant structural damage that you were seeing in the homes and other infrastructure along the coast that were then deposited onto these major roadways due to the significant storm surge. So access to the most affected areas was a challenge, <clears throat> especially in the early days. So in short, what our preliminary team showed us right away that we had now a design level event that was an important test for the Florida Building Code. We had evidence that the 100 year floodplain was indeed inadequate to protect the communities exposed in these areas and that many parts of this older building inventory were certainly not prepared to take the effects of this hurricane. Severe damage was noted in a multitude of kind of critical facilities and even in things like aircraft hangars, marine facilities and other industrial buildings, making metal building systems, hospital performance and power infrastructure equally important areas to consider. So as a result, we activated a tier three and started our field data collection process, which is now the cue for David to take over and tell us more about that effort. All right, thanks, Tracy. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Excellent. All right, if you don't mind advancing to the next slide and we'll go ahead. So just to recap, as, as Tracy had mentioned earlier, our the field response was phased and primarily in the two phases that you see here, what I'm calling a fast one and then somewhat a, a fast two, but really funded by the Florida Building Commission, a, a follow up uh, to that. And you see the dates and the team members there. And in addition, there was also uh, data collected by the FEMA MAT teams quite a bit later in um, December and, and, and there on um, that they were also able to share some of that data with us as well. For our first FAST team, you see the, uh, the, the dates there, 12 to 15 October. We were there uh, just a, a, you know, about 48 hours after landfall. 
um, with the objectives similar to our, our, our scout teams with, uh, with STEER. So cluster-based sampling across the, the wind hazard gradient, trying to get representative samples of building performance. And in particular, trying to focus on old versus new construction um, and clusters, clusters where those uh, two building types were adjacent to each other. So a suburban neighborhood with uh, newer construction right next to, to older so that we can make an equal comparison across those. What we saw uh, with the, the devastation in, in Mexico Beach and the significant storm surge that Tracy uh, alluded to earlier, there was also certainly a need to do a, a more detailed follow-up focusing specifically on um, the Mexico Beach area and coastal impacts. And so that, as I mentioned earlier, was funded by the Florida Building Commission, still supported by STEER, um, and involved a, uh, a team of experts that with um, expertise in, in coastal engineering. And so the objectives there were more the surge and the wave run-up measurements, so trying to capture the hazard, um, as well as um, documenting in much more um, high density the, the coastal damage in Mexico Beach and Port St. Joe, trying to capture as many structures there as possible, the, the forensic load path of those. So if you advance next. So the data collection methodologies that we, that we used here primarily fell into the three categories that you see here. So door-to-door -door assessments using the Fulcrum app, um, which embedded geotagged photographs, field notes, a, a standardized survey form, all in one georeferenced record uh, that was synced in real time, connection permitting, uh, which there was, was primarily if you were on AT&T, um, synced to a, a web platform so that the VAS could begin to look at those in, in near real time. Um, additionally, we deployed a street uh, level panoramas and applied street view system from the Nary Rapid Center. Um, uh, and then also uh, two UAVs also from the Nary Rapid Center, a Matrice and a Phantom 4 um, for uh, collecting overlapping imagery from which we could construct the structure for motion models. And so our typical approach is, is laid out as you see here, wherever possible, um, we tried to overlap these. Um, so that we got full extent of the, of the data coverage. So we may have the door-to-door -door assessments in a particular area of interest, but then we would also have street view cameras coming, uh, uh, vehicle come through that same area to document every structure from a terrestrial view and capture the context, as well as the UAV to capture a 3D model from it as well. And potentially these data sets could be integrated, the, the street view and the, the UAV uh, structure for motion. Uh, so we, we tried wherever possible to have these overlapping, but obviously the coverage of street view and so on was typically greater than, than what we had for the door to door, but those were our major technologies. So next. So I'll talk just a, briefly here a little bit more about the app based assessment, because this is not only the door to door assessments, but it also sets the, the framework, if you will, for the final building performance data set that was published and is available on design safe. Um, so as I alluded, it was deployed on the smartphone. Um, it's uh, proprietary through Fulcrum and through our Fulcrum community account. And within each record, each pin that you see here is included geotagged photographs, um, each with their own separate geotags, so you know where the photo was taken. It could also include audio recordings, any freeform text, as well as some standardized data fields that um, prompted the, the investigator to document certain building attributes, uh, but primarily for our field teams, these structural attributes that would not be easy to, to um, gather later just from imagery. All right, so next. All right, so this is a, a geospatial data, a summary of the data then. And it's a little bit hard to fit everything in, in one map, but I trust this uh, visualizes it adequately enough. So on the left, starting there, this is the sort of zoomed out view. Um, so each of the blue dots are one of the building assessments. Uh, the red dashed lines there are the, um, the, the peak gust uh, wind contours from ARA's maps. Uh, then you see the center line of the track there and the dashed black line. Um, and so you see we clustered quite a bit of assessments in the Panama City region, as well as in the Mexico Beach, extending down through to um, Port St. Joe and, and further south. But we also tried to capture some of the inland areas in Mariana and some of those smaller um, interior towns as well to document the, the, inland, the um, inland progression of the damage. Um, and to, to a lesser extent here than we've, we've done in some other events, we did try to sample, as I mentioned, that was one of our objectives is sampling across the hazard gradient. Um, but, sort, but constraining ourselves primarily within that 120 to 150 range rather than going all the way out. 
So then if you um, notice as well, the light blue line, it's a little bit harder to see in that overall map. That is our street view routes, which are a little bit more visible in the, uh, the Panama City region. There you can see the individual building assessments now color coded by an overall damage level, as well as the overlapping um, UAV data sets where we collected that and the street view imagery, and then the same for Mexico Beach down at the bottom. Um, again, this reflecting both our initial fast one steer deployment, as well as the, the follow up work that was primarily funded by the Florida Building Commission. Next. So some illustrative observations. Um, obviously, we don't have time in, in this to go in detail through these. Um, but we saw extensive failures in both commercial and residential construction um, in, institutional basically across all, all occupancy types. Um, some extending, uh, for example, the, the Panama City uh, Beach one there at the top left, this is a, a marina, a large volume building that um, Jeff is going to talk about later. One of the uh, our observations of damage to those is actually what sparked a, a follow up rapid that we ended up submitting. Um, but this was out in Panama City Beach, below design level, and yet we in a newer building, and yet we saw significant collapse. Um, you see the Tyndall Air Force Base, um, the significant damage to the hangar there. Now that's as you're getting close to the landfall region. And then as you get down to Mexico Beach um, and, and those areas, Carabel is where we see the significant storm surge effects, um, both to buildings and to infrastructure, um, to the extent that you see in, in the Mexico Beach, um, one of the, the middle right there, where entire buildings are picked up and, and were pushed across the road into adjacent structures. And that happened um, quite often, um, unfortunately. But there were also bright spots. Um, you see in the bottom right, the Port St. Joe, this is a neighborhood in Beacon Hill, uh, which per the best estimates that we have, experienced 140, uh, 145 mile an hour wind speeds and yet suffered very little cladding damage um, was the extent of it. Um, obviously some in, in water intrusion as well through soffits and some other things that still need to be worked on, uh, but structurally some excellent performance. And in a way, this characterized one of the uh, things that stood out to us with the most, the high variability in performance between all these, um, where even in areas with the, the significant hazard, particularly once you got away from the, the storm surge where freeboard was the primary predictor um, or, or causal factor. But as you got more inland, performance was really quite varied. Um, and there's lots of opportunities then to, to dive into that into more detail and figure out those causal factors. So next slide. So next, let me briefly speak then to the what we call the data enhancement quality control. Um, so if you've been on the uh, you know, field reconnaissance uh, team or deployment before, you, you probably experienced this where you typically come out of the field with a lot of raw data. Um, and in our case, this was the location of the assessment, some general damage ratings, the, photo, the photographs, and maybe some freeform text. But then what we would do is we had a team um, with our vast graduate students and others that would then extract data from those from our, our raw field data as well as aggregate other uh, supplemental data sources. So public records from count from the counties, uh, the NOAA aerials. Um, we had access to the Eagle View pictometry platform, uh, pre and post street view, the UAV data, et cetera, to then enhance the data set to fill out those remaining fields that did not get um, entered in um, while on site. So that allowed our field teams to work more efficiently, and yet we could still produce a, a, a data set that had nominally the same uh, standardized fields with it. And then finally, it would undergo a quality control where we had multiple uh, people to sort of stratify the samples and multiple people reviewing um, and, and checking for, for errors or other systemic um, deficiencies in the data set and trying to correct as many as possible. So next, so briefly again, some of the um, supplemental sources that are referred to here, um, the, the RAPID get, have access to the PIX4D, which we were able to host our SFM models and the point files on, allowed for virtual inspections, um, would work quite well. Um, the street level panoramas, um, also through the RAPID NARI, through a, a server they were able to host there was helpful. Um, and so each of these were manually, um, the students in the VAST are manually going through these sources and adding and enhancing to this the raw data set that we had from the field. So next slide then. So this in a way, I'm not going to go through all of this. Obviously, you can look at our data report uh, published on DesignSafe and it has um, all of these same fields listed. 
But this gives you an idea of the fields that we tried to capture for as many structures as possible. Um, and it's not always possible to, to get every single one, depending on how badly it was damaged and what, what views we had available to us. Um, but this is the suite, if you will, um, of the basic metadata, the basic building attributes, the structural details, and then finally the damage details, specifically including not just overall damage ratings, but the, um, the component level damage as well to the major building components. And next, and lastly, then this is just illustrative. Um, you know, if we're collecting year built and we're collecting this other metadata, this then allows us to explore these data sets further. And so, for example, um, these are the building assessments by building code. If you were wanting to do a follow on study to look at the impact of the code, and this is the number of, of samples or number of, of records that we have within each major building code edition um, in Florida, as well as the building code class, whether it be the, um, the standard building code or residential. So obviously there's lots more visualizations that we could do with this, um, but I'll stop here for now and turn it over to Jeff uh, to be able to talk a little bit more about their response to Michael. Yeah, thanks, David and Tracy. So uh, as Tracy mentioned and David mentioned as well, uh, the Rapid deployed um, to help A, support STEER uh, in their data collection, and then also uh, to support a uh, follow-on Rapid grant from NSF uh, for additional um, data collection. So uh, this is uh, one picture from the field. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the, thanks Tracy, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the with the Rapid facility, we're part of the NERI network. We're one of the equipment uh, facilities. You can see us up in the left of, of here in this, uh, in this kind of photo of, or image of all the all the NERI sites. Uh, so we work closely uh, with Design Safe and with Converge, um, and and then uh, we serve kind of the broader natural hazards research community and provide equipment and expertise for uh, and and staff for field reconnaissance missions. Uh, so our just a, a real quick overview where we fit kind of in the in the. Our, 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 where our science plan fits in the broader uh, natural hazards engineering uh, research community. So we're, we're, we, we have rapid, we have instrumentation and services, and our goal is to go out and collect these data products, help users organize the data products, process data into a useful format for research, and then help them archive and publish it all in Design Safe as well. Uh, so you can go on, Tracy. Uh, so. We have an interdisciplinary portfolio of equipment. Um, we've had uh, lots of deployments. Now we're, we're at about 80 deployments uh, for a variety of disciplines and a variety of natural hazards. Um, so uh, this includes geomatics technologies. We've got structural instrumentation, wind and storm surge instrumentation. Uh, we, we have some uh, social science specific equipment as well as ground investigation equipment, imaging equipment, and, and all of that. And you can find more information about the Rapid facility at our uh, website uh, listed there. Okay, uh, so for Hurricane Michael, as I said, uh, we had what was really interesting for the rapid facility is we spent uh, uh, 2016, 17, and a bit of 2018 uh, building the facility uh, kind of from the ground up. Uh, it didn't exist before. We had to acquire equipment and figure out how to operate and all that stuff. And about a month after opening our doors to operations was this enormous hurricane uh, with, and, and everyone explained the significance of this hurricane. So it was a really great opportunity for us to test out uh, all of our equipment and our field operations, and then to also support STEER, which was really in, in their kind of uh, beginning phases as well. So this really was a great opportunity to test this kind of reconnaissance arm of the NERI network and of uh, design uh, of NSF supporting these EERs. Uh, so, so really great opportunity. So we put, you know, some resources into this as well. Uh, you know, our own kind of facilities operational resources to make sure that we went out and uh, really took advantage of this amazing data gathering opportunity. So uh, as we mentioned, uh, uh, we, we deployed a, a whole array of equipment, almost took everything in our por portfolio down to Florida uh, uh, to support this. Uh, we had many uh, UAVs uh, with us and, and lots of different LIDAR equipment and then lots of different survey equipment as well. 
Uh, we've published uh, now as, as part of the STEER data set available at the DOI shown, shown there, uh, really five data sets by location. Uh, they're called Gulf Air Drive, a, a residential community, Mexico Beach Water Tower, which I'll show is a, is a collapsed water tower, Oceanside Village, another kind of residential area of Mexico Beach, Under the Palms, which is yet another residential area of Mexico Beach, and then uh, these these waterfront apartments that we just titled waterfront apartments, and I'll I'll, I'll show all of these, and and we had a mix of both UAS and lidar data, and and you can see that listed there. And there's also uh, GPS data uh, for many of these that can be helpful for uh, developing more accurate 3D models. Uh, so just to give you an idea of the types of data sets, um, so here is uh, a data set that was collected for Gulf Air Drive, and that, that's really just one of the streets in this neighborhood is called Gulf Air Drive, it's the one that kind of loops around the outside, um, and this neighborhood was, was actually uh, 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 steered it door to doors in this neighborhood, they also drove street view in this neighborhood, so those data sets are also available, and we flew UAS. Uh, over this neighborhood while we were there. Um, so everything's been processed. The raw and processed data are available. We've developed PIX4D structure for motion models. Uh, and uh, there's you know, really great views of residential low rise wood frame structures and, and the extensive damage uh, to, those, to those structures. And go on to the next one. And here's just kind of a blow up of, of what the uh, ortho mosaic uh, one, uh, pull of imagery from uh, the PIX4D model looks like. Uh, so these are pretty high resolution models uh, that uh, we've developed and, and uh, you, know, you can continue to use. Uh, then I wanted to focus on this collapsed water tower. It's, a, I, I think, a really unique uh, piece of data of a, of a detailed structural failure investigation. Um, so we collected both UAS and LIDAR imagery. Uh, you can see the, the top image here is the UAS, is the point cloud developed from the structure from motion model, structure from motion processing from the UAS imagery. The uh, image on the bottom is uh, from the LIDAR uh, data that was collected. Um, and there were uh, about eight different setups used to collect the LIDAR data. And we've been able to um, actually develop measurements of structural sections. And you know, we, we have a good idea of what this tower looked like originally, what, what its uh, you know, components looked like. And we've even been able, uh, with an REU student here, been able to develop a structural model of this, of this water tower. Uh, so I, I think it's a, you know, we, we stopped there with kind of an elastic structural model, but it would be, uh, it, you know, I think really worthwhile for someone to, to go and pick this up and do some additional failure investigation. Uh, and then this data set that we called the waterfront apartments, I, I think these are a unique uh, set of structures. They're right on the shore. Um, they had significant uh, storm surge damage and uh, wind damage. And uh, so we collected a really complete data set, uh, both again with UAS and LIDAR data, um, and including a really detailed LIDAR scan, uh, several LIDAR scans, really detailed LIDAR point cloud of the entire foundation system, uh, which, which I think is, is quite unique. Uh, so you can go to the next slide. Um, so this is just uh, uh, the structure from motion model showing kind of the wind damage to the elevated portions of the structure. Uh, and again, this structure from motion model is, is processed and, and available on DesignSafe. And uh, if you go one more, so this is a little dark because uh, this, these, uh, you know, I, I was un actually under the foundation of this building with the, with the scanner, moving the scanner around and it was pretty dark. So there's not a lot of color to the LIDAR point cloud, but we, you can definitely, uh, this is a fully detailed foundation system. We can measure every dimension that you would wanna measure about this foundation system that supports this entire row of apartments and, uh, and, and is, is pretty unique. Uh, so that's, that's there all registered and, and, and ready for people to use. So as a summary, uh, the data that was collected kind of from phase two, three, and then the rapid, uh, uh, rapids contributions in phase five, 
you know, there's 736 app-based assessments of individual uh, residences, buildings, uh, 79 assessments of hazard indicators. There's a, almost 3,000 photos. Uh, 2,300 general area photos, there's seven UAV data sets, two very detailed LIDAR data sets, and uh, almost 250 kilometers of street view level panorama. So this is really a, a very complete data set uh, of hurricane damage. And then uh, I'll go through a follow on. Uh, really, I think David should be doing this, but I'll do it anyway. This was very collaborative. Uh, so kind of following Steer's initial study, uh, David, uh, Justin Marshall, who was at Auburn, and uh, and myself, uh, we kind of looked at this damage and said, well, these low rise, large volume buildings were a really big problem. They had a very high fa failure rate. Uh, let's go in and, and collect some data on these buildings in great detail. And uh, so that's exactly what we did. Uh, we developed a rapid proposal and submitted it to NSF and it was supported. Um, and that provided funding for us for uh, a pretty extensive uh, field campaign. Um, so again, uh, this was in collaboration. Uh, the PIs were, were, were David and then Justin Marshall at Auburn. And then I had a kind of collaborative piece uh, here at UW. Uh, we went to the field with rapid staff and a whole bunch of students from Auburn who were super, super helpful. Um, and uh, we worked up uh, in a, a really extensive data set on the performance of some of these buildings. Uh, and so you can go to the next slide. So we detailed nine buildings um, and the data sets are not completely uniform uh, because we'd arrive on site and have different access. Uh, and then the buildings were in different state of, uh, you know, collapse. <laughs> and so, uh, so the data sets are not completely uniform. So for some, there's just UAS. For some, there's very comprehensive LIDAR, GNSS data, and, and lots of photos as well. All of the raw data at this point is, is public and, and, and uh, published. And actually, I, I realized as we were putting this whole uh, webinar together that I never hit go on the publication of the processed LIDAR data sets. So that's going to happen this week. Um, I kind of one of those things when the student graduates and moves on, sometimes you forget to hit hit go. Uh, so so that'll be done. They're all ready. They're they're up there and processed. They just need to, to go through the curation, uh, the last bit of publication. So we'll act like they're ready and available. So these were all steel frame buildings um, and uh, and all had very similar damage. Uh, so here's a map of of the, the nine buildings that we explored. Uh, the, the map shows uh, the, uh, the uh, kind of six of the buildings and then three additional buildings were on Tyndall Air Force Base that's marked down below. And the heat map is the observed wind speeds. Uh, so they were all subject to some pretty good wind speeds. Uh, now this is a video of one of the LIDAR point clouds, uh, process LIDAR point clouds, and I hope it goes okay over Zoom. If not, there's a link on the bottom to YouTube. It is, it is up on YouTube. So this was a marina storage building. Uh, you can see the damage on the front side. What you're seeing, we only scanned uh, with the LIDAR the inside of the building. So you're not seeing the external skin. That's actually the inside of the building kind of projected on the, on the outside face. So as we enter the building here, uh, you can see the, the high resolution data set. These point clouds have been cleaned. So we're showing kind of the uncleaned point cloud as, as you see the floor and everything. And then we've got clean versions where we remove some of the debris as well. You can see, you know, this is a very, very detailed three-dimensional model of the damage. Uh, we can pull out structural sections. We can make some really detailed measurements with this, uh, with this point cloud. So that gives you an idea of, of what's, what's up there for the most detailed of the building data sets uh, available. And, and there's probably four or five at that level of, of detail. Uh, okay, Trace, you can go on. <clears throat> uh, I think we gotta just hit next. Yeah. <laughs> oh, videos. <laughs> 
Okay, great. Uh, okay, and then this is uh, some of the things, the, the reason why we wanna go out and collect very detailed LIDAR on, on some of these damaged buildings is because it allows us to really enhance our structural investigation. So uh, the cloud in the upper left and the cloud in the upper right, the differences are is that we're able to go into the point cloud and remove debris and reveal the structural system that we really care about back behind. So you see we've removed boats and boat racks and, and all kinds of debris. And we're able to see even the lateral frames, the brace frames in the background and, and the one on the lat and the one on the bottom. And, and we didn't see those before. Uh, so that's that's one of the great powers of, of LIDAR and why we want to do these investigations. And then uh, also from these point clouds, we can extract just key structural components of interest. So here's another uh, collapsed uh, large volume building. This one, we were very sad. It's a, it's a beer distributor. There was a lot of beer that went to waste. Um, and, uh, uh, but we're able to pull out uh, some of the key structural components, in this case, uh, some of the long span, uh, long span frames. And, uh, and then David and his team uh, have, have received additional funding from uh, the Metal Building Manufacturers Association, and they've actually been, been developing structural models um, of, of some of these buildings using the point clouds. And also uh, in, a, in a couple of cases, we were actually able to get structural drawings as well. Um, and, and so they're continuing their investigation and trying to figure out kind of what happened. And, and a lot of the failure modes really were very similar. This was definitely a case of, of uh, a few uh, where, where maybe we could see some additional design uh, changes and considerations uh, to result in overall better performance. So that, that kind of highlights the rapids activities. So we'll turn it back over to Tracy to uh, wrap it up for us. Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, I hope you appreciate from that presentation just how cool and fun, um, you know, Jeff and David make recon look and, and actually, do, right, <laughs> including, you know, serving beer. Uh, what was it? A beer warehouse distributor. It's awesome. I've never had that one before. Um, so what I want to do now is wrap to just help um, us understand the ways that you can benefit from all this hard work. The photos you saw as the transition slides for each segment of the talk they showed the faces of people who went out in really rough conditions and generated some powerful data. And so what we wanna talk about now in our closing is how you can actually take advantage of that data in your own research. So the first thing I wanted to do is just remind you and compile uh, the list of data sets that actually are available for the different phases of the work here. Now I know the DOIs are quite long. These are all you know, linking back to design safe, but for your own reference, just remember this. Look for project 2111, 2112, 2113. That's one series of projects we issued or uh, releases we did. And then project 2133. If you want to jot those down, those are the four projects that essentially map to the different phases we talked about today. Um, and so you can always go into Design Safe's published wing of the data depot and find those valuable data sets. So once you get into those data, we wanted to help you think about well, what would you do with this data? And I think this is more than just Hurricane Michael, right? Each of these rare events, um, these, these fantastic opportunities to validate the performance of our built environment, you know, they all have similar learning opportunities. So today we wanna to speak to Michael, but with the encouragement to look at lots of this reconnaissance data that the Rapid, Steer and other entities are helping to push into Design Safe for all of you. So the first uh, part that I wanted to say is these performance assessments, those detailed app-based assessments that David talked about, they're exceptionally valuable for you know, training data in computer vision tasks. We've seen the Sim Center and other organizations already taking uh, advantage of these to train these types of algorithms to identify features of buildings, to create building inventories, and to automate damage detection. You know, Think about the fact that you have all the street view data and automating a way to detect damage and other features in that imagery is quite powerful. The Sim Center is working on tools that actually bring computer vision to that application. This is a great data set to use in collaboration with those tools. The second is the idea that as, as David mentioned, we, we sample buildings to do those door-to-door -door assessments, but there's a lot of buildings we don't touch just for interest of time, but are included in our street level panoramas, those you know, applied street view imaging systems. So as a result, you can do virtual assessments. You can walk the streets um, in the Michael affected regions and build out additional assessments beyond what we were able to do with our limited time. 
And that can be really valuable for creating a robust data set to develop empirical fragilities, to validate loss models, or even to examine the performance of buildings by code era. And we had some great examples of the regulatory evolution in this region that can be really helpful. You can also think about linking that with additional data that's been generated um, afterward to look at recovery processes. So there's a lot of value in using those street view panoramas without ever going back to the field to learn about this event. And that also then gives you the ability to study things beyond buildings. A lot of STEER's focus in this event was buildings, but remember there's a lot of other distributed features that that street view captures. Uh, for example, debris fields, uh, damage to distributed infrastructure like the power infrastructure. Those could all be mined out of the street view images. And so we've seen a lot of value in using street level panoramas to basically capture areas quickly. And then from the comfort of your desk, being able to evaluate those or even automate the processing of those to generate high level trends, impressions and data on the event. Not that that will ever replace a human doing up close forensic work, but it can better guide you where to go back and collect more data, or in this case, how to study an event that occurred a couple of years ago. You can still study it from your desk, thanks to the work of STEER and the rapid facility in making this data available. Of course, we have these beautiful uh, LIDAR and UAS data sets um, that, that Jeff helped to showcase to do these kinds of in-depth understandings of failure and progressive collapse that have key implications for the design, particularly of these large volume buildings. And I think that's an exciting deep dive in this data set. And of course, that waterfront apartment example, again, give us the ability to look at those multi-hazard demands that we see in coastal communities, to understand how the interaction of wind and surge results in the performance we saw and ultimately reveal ways that we can mitigate those damaging effects. So with that, we wanted to close with enough time to take some questions. We wanna acknowledge uh, NSF in the number of projects supported and in, included in this presentation, um, as well as support from the uh, state of Florida, but also just all the people. I mean, if you think of all the people whose hands and eyes and passion touch these data sets, they did this work for you to give you a chance to experience these events, even if you couldn't join us in the field. So I hope that um, you benefit from their labor. It's truly a labor of love. And with that, we're gonna stop our presentation and take questions. All right, great. Thank you everybody for a wonderful presentation. This stuff was so cool. I'm Scott Brandenburg. I'm a professor at UCLA and one of the co-PIs on the Design Safe project. And I'll be um, moderating the, the Q&A. So if you have questions, please, at the bottom of Zoom, click on the little Q&A button as opposed to the chat and um, put your questions there. And then I'll, I'll moderate the questions. And uh, I guess first, congratulations, Tracy, David, and, and Jeff on winning the Dataset Award. I think that's that's wonderful. You all did a great job curating the data and making it publicly available. It's a really nice resource. Um, I did want to mention we're going to continue these awards. So if anybody listening has a data set that you would like to um, curate this year, you know, anything curated between January 1st and December 31st will be eligible for the 2021 data set award. And, you know, you, you can come and do one of these webinars and uh, have your data um, promoted on the Design Safe website and so forth. Um, all right, so let's get to the questions. So first from Karthik, it is my understanding that X zones could have flood risk. It is just that we don't expect them to get inundated from a typical 100 year type of event. It is quite possible that the surge from Michael was perhaps beyond 500 year from a return period perspective locally, which led to X zones getting flooded is this the case from your research? Or are you suggesting that the designation of flood zones in these affected areas were wrong and do not characterize the true flood risk? Well, I think the most important thing to clarify, well, first I would refer you back to the paper um, in, in Coastal Waterways um, that Andrew Kennedy and the team wrote because they were the ones to dive into this issue. There's an important provoking of the, of the idea that is a hundred year the right MRI to be using? And I think that's the question. Certainly that's what's used, but there's a question of whether that is the right recurrence interval. So definitely I think it's less about, um, you know, people don't expect to be flooded because we are, we are messaging to them that you're outside, quote, the floodplain. The fact that we set that at 100 years is one issue. 
The second fact is people then believe they are not at risk and they don't carry flood insurance and they aren't bound by other construction requirements outside those zones. So I think we have a two pronged problem. What is the MRI? Uh, Kennedy et al. would argue it is not appropriate. 100 is not an appropriate MRI to use. But the second is then how do we message risk honestly to communities if they think they're in an X zone and therefore safe and therefore don't need to be protected or aren't at risk? And there's a two pronged problem there. All right, great. Thanks, Tracy. The next one from an anonymous attendee, if, if you're embarrassed to have your name associated with the question, you can remain anonymous um, or just want to be anonymous. You don't have to be embarrassed. But do garage doors show up as large doors in the data set? I think it's a great question. Yes, I'll, I'll answer that one. Yes, um, large doors generically is anything larger than a entry door. Um, so for residential construction, if it says there's a large door present, that would be a garage door. All right, thanks, David. And then from David Nolan, I'm having trouble understanding the numerical scale of the assessments. Do you have a person look at every single building or house in each town or a subset? Do you pick neighborhoods to fully survey? And then he has a follow-up later, but maybe we can answer that one first. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll start off and then Tracy or, or Jeff, you wanna jump in. Um, to the numerical, to speak to numerical scale first, it's, as we mentioned, there's 736 app-based assessments. And so, we have component level damage, detailed information for about 750. We also have captured in the UAV data sets, the street view, et cetera, many, many more buildings beyond that that could be assessed to some to varying levels of detail, um, but are not part of, you know, have, the information has not been extracted yet. And that's all simply just dependent upon, you know, we had a certain amount of time in the field and a certain amount of time afterwards to sort of curate this data, data set. Uh, there's much more that could be done with it, though, to expand it to entire neighborhoods, entire towns. Um, right now, they're just samples from those, representative samples from them. Okay, great. That was the follow-up question. Could it be extended to uh, kilometer by kilometer or, you know, the size of a neighborhood? So I think you... And I'll just say, it all depends on what you're trying to do with it. If you're, if you're looking at a, you know, kilometer by kilometer scale, that's where some of these computer vision techniques may be ideal because you're just trying to aggregate data over larger, um, larger areas. You may not need super detailed component level damage. Um, so you can do that with the UAV or the, the street view data sets and may not necessarily need to, need to be limited to the app-based assessments that we have. Mm -hmm. All right, another question from Jane Lynn. Is there a single compiled data set available or a full Excel sheet of the observed and recorded data? And I think Tracy, you answered this a little bit by showing all of your- uh, Yes, yeah. Publish. So if you just search Michael or you go to um, the recon uh, portal, because that will have an ability to click on Hurricane Michael's event, you'll see all the data attached to it. But in short, we have a detailed data report that steps you through each folder and tells you what's in there and, and how to make sense of it. So I encourage you to jump into those projects. I'll drop the project numbers in the chat for your quick reference. Um, that would be the best way to dive in. They're well documented. And, I, and I'll also add there, if you do have a question about the data set, hey, where do I find this? Feel free to reach out to me. I'm more than happy to point you in the right direction if something's a little bit confusing for some reason. All right, great. And I'll, I'll remind everybody too, every published data set does have a DOI. So you can cite the data. You know, you don't have to only cite the paper or the report. You can cite the exact data product that you're using if you reuse it. Um, all right, and then Fred Hahn asks, what would be the best way to walk the streets with the street view data? Does DesignSafe have a good way to view those files or is there a better external viewer? Well, we, we've had a combination of approaches to this. Um, the Rapid has helped us to host the data very quickly for immediate consumption. We have also uploaded data to Google and actually had it viewable through their Street View platform. And Mapillary is a new platform we've migrated to. Uh, David, you can correct me. Is this one still on Google because it's an older event? Uh, Mapillary is new for us. Yeah, so this one is actually still just hosted on the, the Street View data is still hosted on the Rapid servers. Yeah, okay. Um, we should take it, and that I was thinking about that the other day, I'd like to move all of these uh, older data sets to Mapillary. And the reason Mapillary, there's a few reasons, but one, it's just a much simpler uploading process workflow to get the data up there. Um, and it also sort of keeps it separate from... Uh, I guess more from an ethics perspective, keeps it separate from Google, where most people go to just find out, you know, about this house they're going to buy and so on. So, um, yeah, that's that's sort of what we're doing at the moment. But I believe 
I don't know. Pull, Scott, pull those wanna... URLs up. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Jeff. Design safe. There, there might be a tool coming soon. To do it. Um, well, I think that that may be why Fred asked the question. He's working on an app called Tag It that will allow people to um, tag things within data sets and you know potentially um, use that. So. Um, <laughs> Yeah, th there is actually a Street View app. So we've been we've been working with um, names escaping me at Design Safe, and there there will be a Street View viewer at Design Safe uh, accessible through Hazmapper before too long. Um, it's kind of in beta right now, and we've seen a couple iterations of it. Uh, and and the idea moving forward is that these Street View data sets are uh available kind of both in mapillary and through the design safe viewer um uh and that that's kind of the plan moving forward at least for the rapid uh, the ones that that the rapids involved with but i think that'll be the probably the plan for for the steer collected ones as well um all right great so we're we're running out of time a little bit but i think we can answer these three questions before Charlie wraps us up here. So next, what is the methodology used to identify structural section sizes in the point clouds? The methodology to identify structural sections in the, yeah. So yep. we're fitting, so we're taking lots of points. So, you know, we, we've got this kind of three dimensional element. We're fitting planes where we can identify planes. And then for the water tower, we knew roughly the age of construction, and we actually went back and grabbed some steel manuals from uh, that era and were able to identify likely, and it's not, you know, 100% sure uh, that, that these are the structural sections, but uh, we're pretty, pretty sure that, that we've identified structural sections. So we're taking, you know, lots of points fitting planes to those points, and then measuring distances between them to determine things like flange thickness and things like that. So it's not <clears throat> dependent just on a single, the accuracy of a single point. You're actually using kind of the average uh, estimation of a, of a lot of points. And we, uh, that's, that's the way you want to make those measurements. Great, thank you. The, the next question is about integrating other kinds of data. So this is a good question from Alexis Rodriguez Avellaneda. Um, thank you for your nice presentation. I'm a first year Fulbright PhD student from Columbia at Ohio State University. And I've been looking for outage data, electrical system outage for previous hurricane events in the Florida state area. But I found data only for events after 2017. Do you have access to that information? For instance, for Hurricane Irma? Sorry to go a little bit off topic. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, STEER doesn't um, have the outage data. If anything, we study the structural elements only. So we do have an IRMA data set, but it's only uh, buildings um, in that curated data set, sorry. We do, I guess the closest would be in our PVRR. We typically try to at least track outages, but there it's much more broader. It's, it, it depends on what level of detail you're wanting there. Yeah, and there may be another source for that kind of information that could be brought in and combined with the reconnaissance data that you have, um, which would be a cool, you know, data integration exercise. Um, okay, one more question. How do you take rich NERI data sets and extrapolate those lessons learned to other communities around the world who may not have your resources and what work is being done to close this technology gap? Well, I, you know, I, I would say um, in response to this that in addition to responding to events, you know, this is an example of a stateside event, um, we have and do respond to international events and, and Eric knows this actually, he's working on one of ours. Um, but I do think that more broadly, I see at least, you know, two ways. One of the challenges is all construction is local. Meaning the reason I started with the regulatory context in this is that we need to understand um, how people build and why they build the way they build. And that's often flame, framed by regulatory environment and access to certain building technologies, which is not always available in other countries. So in opportunity areas where there is an immediate analog, we can definitely make those extrapolations. And a lot of what is reflected in the International Building Code is driven by things observed you know, in, in the US, for example, that leads to code refinements potentially extrapolated elsewhere. But more notably, I would say two things are, are critical. A, 
that organizations like the RAPID as well has deployed equipment to study events overseas. We've all committed to do the same. The other thing I think is really exciting is that there's Google Street View Mapper organizations all over the world, actually people with Street View systems that we have activated in events where we wanted to quickly get data in communities that were very difficult to access and they've been able to image for us. And we're using this right now in Bolivia in one of our sites, uh, not with STEER, but in some of my development work. So I think the cool part is some of these technologies are so um, pervasive around the world. We have drone operators in Bolivia, you know, scanning for us and sending the data that a lot of what we've learned about sharing data and being very agile has given us a global network of common platforms that we now can talk to each other and even do this work distributed. And I think that's the best part to serve countries that have that gap um, and not as much access as we do. All right, thanks a lot, Tracy. And thanks again for a great presentation for all three of you and congrats. And I will turn it over to Charlie to wrap us up. Hey, all. Hey, thanks so much. A great presentation. That's some very valuable information. Uh, we appreciate your all's time presenting it. And thank you very much. Thank you for using Design Safe. So, and finally, let me reshare my screen here. and get rid of the gray boxes. So if you have any other further questions for our presenters, feel free to uh, uh, put those on Slack and our every the entire Design Safe community is on Slack as well. So you may ask your questions there and get a response. If not, you can always email uh, one of us and we'll make sure that the presenters get the questions and they can uh, respond back to you. Thanks, so thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for uh, for the participants in asking the questions as well. And of course, just to reiterate what Scott was saying, we have the next uh, set of data set awards going to be uh, for 2022. And to be eligible, uh, just make sure your data set is posted and, and curated by December 2021 on DesignSafe. And of course, you know, yeah, you'll be able to present your data and findings in a DesignSafe exclusive webinar, similar to the one we had today. And of course, you will be featured on our DesignSafe's main page as well. So that's actually really cool. Uh, so please get your uh, data sets into published on DesignSafe by December 2021 to be eligible. Finally, uh, our Design Safe training archive. So when this video is all done and curated, it will be posted to our Design Safe training channel. And it's got kind of a facelift as well. So go check it out. Uh, all the videos are posted there. They are directly linked on the page itself. So you can view them there. Or of course, you can go to our YouTube channel and view them there as well. So uh, many thanks to Hedda for uh, this new version. It looks fantastic. Also, uh, once again, here is the QR code for the uh, survey. So feel free to scan this. Uh, please do. Uh, please respond to it as well. And, and hopefully we can get you some better and our, uh, webinars in our coming, in our coming future uh, tailored to what it is you're looking for, what it is you need. And once again, thank you so much to our presenters today, uh, Tracy, David, and Jeffrey. Uh, we really appreciate your time and efforts on this. And this was some great data and very valuable information that is uh, being stored on our system. So we appreciate it. Uh, once again, if you have any other questions, feel free to hit us up on Slack in the general channel. Uh, you can also, of course, email us at training at designsafe-ci.org or uh, fill out a help ticket um, on Design Safe as well. And Thank you very much for joining us this Wednesday afternoon. Uh, hope you all have a very safe day and we'll see you all next time. Thank you. And thank you, Scott. Thanks everyone. Yes, thank okay. you. All right, thanks everyone. We'll see you all next time. All right. Thanks, thanks for, thanks for giving us the, the opportunity and uh, just everything the Design Safe does. It's been, uh, it's been wonderful working with y'all. Hey, thank you, David. That's awesome. I agree. <laughs>